Good morning. Morning. Little Dal, whenever you get your teeth taken out and you get the Laffy Gas, you should send me some videos. Um, I'd eat it with a bag of popcorn. You know, wash them with a bag of popcorn and take great delight in it. So it's great to be back with you. Um, that's all the salutations you get because I have a long sermon today and I'm looking forward to lunch because Tanner's paying for it. Um, if you would, open your Bibles to Philippians. Uh, Philippians chapter 1 would be a great place to go. And we will begin there in just a Well, we won't begin there, but we'll get there in just a moment. Philippians chapter 1. And after you do that, you can take your Sacred Selection songbook to uh, number 507. Number 507. We'll look at that song in just a moment. That will be the focus of our sermon today. Philippians chapter 1, song number 507. The song... Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother? Uh, Written in 1903 by Mr. Fred A. Fillmore. Mr. Fillmore lived from 1856 to 1925. His father was a preacher and a hymn writer. And so whenever his father died, him and his older brother took over that business, and they started writing hymns themselves. Mr. Fillmore wrote over 23 song texts, number... um, 133 tunes and notable songs that he wrote for you would be, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. You know, I know that my Redeemer lives, that one. Um, Many of his songs have the same theme, and that theme being sowing, working for the Lord. This song is one of those, obviously, as you can see in the title, Sowing the Seed of the Kingdom, showing themes of sowing in times of ease and in times of hardship. And as we go throughout this song, as we go throughout the sermon, I'll point those out to you. So next time you sing this song, you can be like, hey, this, is, this verse is talking about whenever being a Christian is being hard, whenever a Christian's life is easy. And in a moment, we'll look at those. But at this time, go ahead and we'll sing number 507. Thank you. Now, are you? Are you? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom? What are you doing in your life for God? What are you doing? Turn your attention to Philippians chapter 1. We'll start reading in verse 12 in just a moment. In here we read of Paul. Paul is the author of this letter. We read at the beginning and the end of what Paul is doing. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12, he opens this chapter with a little bit of his life. And we, here we have a reference to his imprisonment. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Turn to, first, or turn to chapter 4 and verse 21 and 22. Chapter 4 and verse 21. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Especially those of Caesar's household. Paul is most likely being held in the prison. That's where most prisoners are held, especially today, which would have been close to Caesar's home. Philippi at this time was only about 10,000 to 15,000 residents, which is about half the size of Harlan. And so everybody kind of knows everybody. While he's in prison, Paul is optimistic. He says that the whole imperial guard and that everybody else knows why he's in prison. Everybody knows that he's in prison on account of Christ. They know why he's there. While in prison, he is optimistic. Turn back to chapter 1. While he is... In this state of imprisonment, he makes three quote. He makes three, yeah, quotes that are very optimistic that I don't know any of us could make while we were in prison. Philippians chapter one, verses twelve through fourteen. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. He's talking about his imprisonment there. Verse fifteen. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. 
The former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Let's get down to verse 20. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be it, that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. So these three quotes, he's optimistic. I'm imprisoned, so what? I don't care. Because I'm here for Christ. Good and bad preachers are tolerable. That's what he says in this chapter. Because no matter what they talk about, as long as Christ is mentioned, Christ is preached. And I don't care whether I live or I die, because whether I live, I get to preach Christ myself. Or if I die, I get to go meet him, and everybody knows that I'm going to meet him. I'm in prison. I don't care, because Christ is preached. Good and bad preachers are tolerable because Christ is preached. Whether I live or I die, I don't care. It doesn't matter because Christ is preached. I get to do something for Christ. Let's back up to verse 13. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Everybody knows what he's in here for. Everybody knows these statements that he's making. They know that he's optimistic. They know that he doesn't care that he's in prison. They know that he doesn't care if they beat him, if they torture him. He's in there for Christ, and he's happy about it. They know what he's in there for. Paul's example of Christ has intruded the lives of the high and mighty, and that's what he's in jail for. Disruption, because he's preaching this Christ crucified, and people don't like it. So he's in there for disruption. His example of Christ has intruded the, the lives of the high and mighty. He, he's in jail, yet that doesn't stop the advancement of the gospel. He's still writing letters. Everybody knows what he's in there for, and at the very least, they know that Jesus lives. The gospel is still advancing. Go back to chapter 4 and verse 22. Philippians 4 and 22. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's. Household. The gospel is in Caesar's household. Philippians was written about 60 to 64 AD, and at that time, Caesar Nero was the Caesar at the time. He was the emperor of Rome. Caesar Nero is one of the most persecutive emperors that ever lived. He did the most damage to the church out of probably anybody in history. He had Christians hung up in his personal garden, tarred, and lit them on fire for light in his garden. He had them hung. They had them crucified like Christ was. It is believed that Peter was crucified upside down by Nero and Paul was beheaded by him. Even though he's such a great persecutor of the church, the gospel's in his own home. The church is pervading his home. It's so ironic to me that the Christians are there and he's the one that persecutes the Christians. So, in the heat of the noonday's glare, as we just sang, as the heat of persecution is bearing down on you, what are you doing? As the heat of persecution is bearing down on Paul, he knows who's living next door. He knows who put him in prison. And yet, that isn't stopping his advancement of the gospel. In the heat of the noonday's glare, are you sowing the seed? Paul always strives to set a godly example. Paul is one of my favorite apostles, and I hope that he is one of yours as well. Because of all of the work that he did, all of the examples that he did, he set a godly example almost always, as we read of. Paul is undoubtedly one of the most influential apostles. He started and encouraged many churches. His life was one of dedication to the Lord and his laws. You can insert that. I'm in the world, but not of the world, quote, here. Yeah, I'm living here. My main focus isn't here, though. Yeah, I'm living here. I'm doing all that I can for Christ, though. This is what Paul's doing. This is what we should strive to do as well. His main focus is the furthering of the gospel. This is why he was able to say those three quotes. If your main focus is Christ, it's a whole lot easier to say, I don't care that I'm in prison. 
I don't care that people are trying to soil my name. I don't care if I die or if I live because my main focus is Christ. Because his most important, the most important thing in his life was the gospel, people could see that and they knew about the gospel because of him. I've heard this example so many times and I'm sure you had as well. What if you're in the company of your friends and they're all cussing up a storm and you're not? Have you heard that before? I don't see any nods, but anyway. Um, anyway, the point of that example is to show that you're different. The point of that is to show that you're different. All these people are in prison. They're afraid for their life. They know who put them in prison. Paul's there too. He doesn't care. He's optimistic. His sight is still on God. Obviously, that would make him a little different. Setting an example. Now turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13. While he was in prison, Paul was still sowing the seed of the kingdom. He was still encouraging churches. That's what Philippian, the letter of Philippians is. It's an encouragement letter to the church. He was still setting that example. And at the bare minimum, he set the example of Christ. And people saw that. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great, and great crowds gathered around him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. I, me and Dad disagreed on this a little bit the other day. The way that I interpret this parable is that the sower is the Christian. Jesus isn't walking around anymore preaching. That's you and me. This is our job. We're supposed to be sowing the seed. So if your job is to spread the seed, as it is, Jesus says himself in Mark chapter 16, go and make disciples of all nations, this is your job. So it is your job to spread the seed. Now take that and plug it into this parable. Your job is to spread the seed. This is your job. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Turn with me, please. Keep your finger in Matthew. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians 3 and 5. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to eat. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. Your job. This is your job. Paul says here, I planted. Apollos watered. I planted. Now put your name in here. You plant. This is your job. This is my job. It's not just the evangelist that a church hires to evangelize to the community. It's not just his job. The church may have hired that guy to do specific evangelism work every day, but it's your job to influence the world as well. Your lives, at your job, influence people. In your home, teach your kids. Teach your husband or your wife, your mom, your dad, this is your job to spread the seed. Jesus died for everybody. Everybody. Everybody deserves to know that Jesus died for them. Everybody deserves to know that they need to know him. Planting. Let's go back to the analogy that Jesus used in the parable. Some fell on rocky ground, and in the end it died. Some fell on thorny ground. In the end, it died. Some fell 
and the sun scorched it, in the end it died. The worst that somebody can do to you is say no. The wor- if, you, if you have the focus that Paul does here in Philippians, or did back there in Philippians now, the worst that somebody can do to you is say no. Yeah, they can beat me, they can put me in prison, they can kill me. Oh well, because I'm going to heaven, I know where my sights are. The worst they can do to me is say no to the gospel. Everyone on earth deserves to have some seed spread to them. Everybody. Jesus died for them too. He didn't just die for the white people in America. He died for the black people. He died for the Asians, the Mexicans. He died for the people that live in India, the people that live in Asia, live in China, Russia. He died for everybody that lived on earth ever. He died for all of them. Not just you and me. All of them. He is their savior as well. And this is the most, the single most important piece of information to ever be found on the earth, to ever be heard by a human ear, ever, that Jesus saves. Everybody needs to hear that. If it's an important message, ring the message out, as the song says. This is our job. We should do it. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother? Ask yourself that question right now. Ask yourself, are you sowing the seed? What are you doing for God? This is the single most important piece of information to ever be heard by a human ear. And it's your job to take it to people. It's your job to bring people to God. It's your job to fill these pews. God's not just going to send 50 people through that door right now. I mean, he could. It's fully within his power. I don't believe that he's just going to send 50 people through the door to hear him preached on Sunday. It's your job. Your job. Now, the worst they can do to you is say no. You never know what the effect, you never know what effect the good news will have on someone. You just never know. God's word has inherent power more than those who spread it. Thanks for the quote, Dad. I stole it from you and I'm not looking at you. God's word has inherent power more than those who spread it. So spread it and give access to God to give the growth. I planted Apollos water, God gave the growth. So plant, so God can give the growth. Let's go back to the parable. The birds devoured it, Christ has preached. At the very least, at the very least, the birds devoured it, Christ has preached. It was on rocky ground and it died, Christ has still preached. It fell on thorny ground and the thorns choked him out, very least Christ has still preached. At the end of the day, at least they know Christ. They know that he exists. They know that he lives because you told him. You told them. At the very least, Christ is preached, whether by life or by death. Whether they say no or they say yes, whether they beat you and put you in prison for talking to them about Jesus, Christ is still preached. And who knows? They might tell their friends. I'm loving the hypothetical conversations I'm having with myself today. They might tell their friends about it. Man, can you believe that this fellow walked up to me and had the nerve to talk to me about Jesus the other day? Can you believe that? Now, that guy that got talked to might be like, Jesus, who's that? I want to learn about him. I want to come to know him. What did that guy say to you? Where can I find them? They might tell their friends about their experience with a sower of God's seed. Now take that hypothetical conversation and take empowerment from it. At the very least, they can do is say no to you. They can go and do all this hypothetical stuff. I'm not going to limit them. God's word has inherent power more than you do. So let it work. Plant the seed. So what it gets choked out, Christ has preached. Everybody needs to come into contact with Jesus, for he died for everybody. Not just you. Not just me. Everybody needs to come into contact with him. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
All that aren't in Christ stand in condemnation. All that stand in Christ, they don't have that anymore. All that stand outside and inside of Christ, he died for, and he still loves them and wants them for his own. So it's not on us to pick and choose. Well, I don't want Brother Billy Bob out there because he stinks. That's not on you. He died, Jesus died for him too, even though he stinks. Spread the seed. It's your job to let people know that Jesus saves. It's my job. If the worst they do is say no, just step back from that position, that mindset of Jesus is everything to me. The worst they do to you is say no. They don't beat you. That's a solemn and comforting thought. You didn't get beaten. It wasn't hard. All you did was say, hey, buddy, you want to talk about Jesus? No? Okay. And walk away. That's solemn. That's peaceful. Because you didn't get beaten. In the morning, bright and fair. We'll go back to our song. In the morning, bright and fair. In the still and solemn night. Whether you're being persecuted for the case of Christ or you're living peacefully, still teaching about Christ. That's what this song's talking about. All along the fertile way. Everybody <laughs> deserves to know Jesus. As soon as you step out of these doors, there's fertile way right there for you. On your way to work in the morning, if you stop and get gas, and that fellow at the cash register is not a Christian, there's fertile way for you. If you're sitting at your desk and your assistant comes in, there's fertile way for you. Those aren't Christians. That's the fertile way this song is talking about. Are you spreading the seed of the kingdom, brother, all the time? When it's hard. When it's easy. All along the fertile way, through all of your walks of life, what are you doing for God? Are you working for God? It was in Caesar's household. Paul was facing times of persecution. He was in prison. He was facing death by the greatest Christian persecutor that ever lived. It was in Caesar's household still. Nero set such a great example of Christian persecution. Yet the gospel's in his home. The gospel's in his home. Now think of people who have persecuted you. The gospel can be theirs too. The gospel can be in their home. It can be theirs as well. The example of one Christian can do so much. Give God the opportunity to work. At the very least, if the very least that you are doing is just acting different, then you're still acting different. If you're not engaging in these immoral activities that the world would have you to, you're still acting different. You're setting an example. The example of one Christian can do a lot. So give God the opportunity to work. Be different in your life. Let your body be a temple of the Lord so people can look at you and say, hey, that's a Christian. Sow the seed. Don't let the very least that you do just be different. Go talk to somebody about Jesus, for he died for them as well. Give God the opportunity to work in your life. The good news needs to be heard by the lower class, the middle class, and the upper class. Don't discriminate. It is a pleasure to work for Jesus. It is honestly a pleasure to be here on Sunday to work with you to work with Christians out all across this country, it is honestly a pleasure for me, and I'm sure it is for you as well. There is such a great benefit to living with Jesus. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves everybody. Everybody. Tell people that. Be an active Christian. Your job is not to be a pew warmer. Your job is not to just sit here and say, Oh, I heard the gospel on Sunday. 
I listened to what the preacher had to say. No, your job is to do that, but to still go out in the world and talk about God. Still talk about Jesus. Be an active Christian. So when you sing this song, when you sing, Are You Sowing the Seed of the Kingdom? Remember your job. Remember, yes, this life may be hard. Yes, it may be hard to talk about God. The very least they can do is say no to you because you're going somewhere better. My mindset as I try to walk throughout this life is I don't care. I try to have this mindset that Paul does. I don't care because I'm going to heaven. This is what I try to focus on. Now, you focus on that. You focus on that thought. It doesn't matter. As long as you're talking about God. So go out and talk about God this week. I challenge you to say one thing to someone about God this week. Whether it's your husband, your wife, your mom, your dad, your child, your co-worker, your boss. Talk to somebody about God. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother? This concludes the lesson. I'm glad that you paid attention. I'm thankful for you all. If you are susceptible to the Lord's invitation, this opportunity is for you. You can be part of the, work, the Lord's work. You can be his child. You can stand in his love and his mercy. This time has been appointed for you to come forward as we stand and sing.